Matthew chapter 14, and we're reading from verse 22 to 33. And the word of God says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Father, I thank you, Lord God. I thank you for this day, Lord God. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord God, to be here. Father, we could have been anywhere else. We could have been somewhere lost, somewhere stuck, my God. We could have been, Lord God, in an abusive relationship. Lord, we could be in many places, Lord God. But you're allowing us, my God, to, to be here today, to be with you, to sit at your feet, to receive from you. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I take authority over the atmosphere of this house, Lord. And in the name of Jesus, every distraction has to leave. Right now, fear has to leave. Insufficiency has to leave. Father, I declare that this is the place, my God, where the Spirit of revelation is found, where a spirit of wisdom is found, Lord, I thank you, Father, for the changes that you're bringing, for the wisdom that you're imparting, my God. I thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. amen. You guys can be seated. <laughs> so, I'm going to make this very simple. I just want to talk to you guys really about three things. Uh, the first thing is, I want to help you guys understand that we shouldn't fall into the error of pursuing the blessings, but to pursue the one that blesses. Amen? Amen. The second thing is, I want you guys to understand the process. Understand the process of how to find Jesus in the storm. Because it's important to know how to find him in the storm. Amen? Because you could be in the storm and you could feel like God's not even there with you. That he's not listening to you. But let me tell you something, he's there. Amen. And thirdly, I want you to help. Uh, I want to help you understand the purpose. What is the purpose for the winds and for the waves? Amen. Amen. And so, you know, as we uh, as we begin to walk with God, and as we begin to get closer with Him, you know, and as we begin to bring our concerns, our worries, you know, our desires before Him, something very beautiful begins to happen in our lives, and we begin to see the manifestation of His power. Right? We see his power to provide. We see yeah. his power to deliver. Sure. His power to heal. Yeah. Right? Amen. And so as we begin to see all these things, it's great and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful experience to speak to the God that, that created the heavens and the earth and to see that he sees fit to listen to us and move on our request on our behalf. Amen. It's a Amen. beautiful thing, right? Yes. But there's something that we have to be careful with, though, is... If we as a people focus solely on, on the manifestation of his power in our lives, we will fall into the error of pursuing his blessings. We will pursue his provisions, we will pursue his hand, but we will never pursue his heart. Mm. Wow. And so we got to be careful that we don't fall into that error, right? right? And so see, in order to understand how we can avoid falling into that is, we don't really need, this sounds crazy, I want you guys to just... just you know, work with me because it sounds crazy. We don't need more miracles. We don't need them to manifest more. What we need is we need revelation. Come on. We need revelation of who he is as the Son of God because the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Yeah. And all else will be added on. So the blessings, the provision, the healing, all of that will come. come We're not going to pursue it. It's going to pursue us. Yeah. You understand that? Yeah. We're going to those things that follow where we go, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> and so we got to be careful that, that we don't fall into that error. And so, you know, prior to this, a couple of verses prior to Jesus walking on water and, and, you know, revealing himself in the storm, the Bible gives an account of Jesus 
teaching, and there were 5,000 people with him, right? And so he told his disciples, he said, hey, it's getting late, let's feed them, right? And he said, all we have is these five breads and these two fish. And so he said, hey, just tell them to sit down. It's okay, I got this. And so the Bible says that from those five loaves and the two fish, he began to feed everybody. Yeah. Everybody ate, you know, to, to satisfy the hunger that they had. And not only that, but there was even enough left to fill baskets afterwards. See, and so the people up to this point, they had seen Jesus cleanse lepers. They had seen him heal the sick. They have now seen, you know, they saw him teach. Like, that's cool. I don't know about you guys, you know, but as a, as a young man, um, I'm 31, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> as a young man, you know, one thing that I've, I've never had in my life, I never really had a, a, a male figure to come into my life and say, hey, you know what, bro, I'm going to, I'm going to help you. I can see you're trying to do good, so I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to teach you. Never. And so then, you know, here's Jesus revealing himself not only as provider, as healer, but as a teacher. And the wisdom that he's giving and the authority by which he's speaking, they've never heard of before, right? But see, there was error in their mindset because they didn't have revelation. They didn't have revelation of who he was. They saw what he did and what he could do for them, and that attracted them. Amen. Does that make sense? So we have to be careful. Now, to help you understand their mindset, uh, the prophet Isaiah had given them prophecy about the coming Messiah. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verse 47. And it says, For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warriors and the uniforms bloodstained by war will be burned. They will be fuel for fire, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice for the throne of his answer to David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of the heavens, uh, of the Lord of heaven's army will make this happen. And so there was a prophecy that was speak, uh, spoken to the people that they were awaiting that there was going to be a Messiah coming and that he would establish a kingdom and that in that kingdom he was going to govern it. And no longer were they going to have to live in oppression. See, because right here they were living under the Roman oppression, right? And so every desire that they had for Christ as provider, every desire that they had for Christ as, as king, as ruler, these were all good things. There's nothing wrong. It's, it's good. It's good for us to bring our, our desires and our needs before God and for Him to bless us. These are all good things. But I'm telling you, without the revelation of who He is, though, we can fall into that error, right? Now it says in John chapter 6, 24, it says, So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor His disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for Him. They found Him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. Yes. For, the God, for God the Father has given me the seal of His approval. See, it's, it's good. It's good that, that we bring our stuff to, to Christ. But we, we have to understand that we have to begin to ask Him to reveal Himself as to who He is. Right? I don't know if that makes sense, but we have to begin to ask Him to reveal Himself to us. Not as provider, not as, as who He is. Understanding what does the Bible mean when it says that He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Hey, what does that mean? What does it mean for Him to even be called Lord in the first place? Why is He the Savior? Right? All these things we need to know. Now, it's at this point that when Jesus begins to see that the people, the people wanted to make him king. The people wanted to make him king. And so it's at this point that he realized, he's like, I can't have that. He's like, because the kingdom that they were seeking was an earthly one. Right. They were seeking an earthly kingdom. And see what Jesus was trying to bring, he was bringing a spiritual kingdom, an eternal kingdom, right? Amen. And so, At this point, he tells his disciples to get into a boat and to cross to the other side of the sea. And so, 
Isaiah, Isaiah 46.10 says that God knows the end from the beginning. There is nothing that happens on the, this earth that God doesn't already know, right? It's not like we live our lives and then we make a mistake and then God says, oh me, what am I going to do now to fix this problem? How am I going to solve this issue for this person now? He, he knows exactly what's going to happen, right? Amen. So now, what you guys got to begin to understand is, is if, right, God knowing, Jesus knowing that there was a storm up ahead, why would he intentionally put the disciples on this boat and send them off by themselves, right? I think that we can all agree that Jesus had a plan for these guys. You guys have to understand that these were the men that Jesus had set in his heart to empower that after his ascension that he was going to send them out and they were going to turn the world upside down by spreading the gospel. Does that make sense? So these were the guys. So we can agree that the, the thoughts and the plans that he had for them were good. They were good plans. Right? Amen. You guys got to talk to me, man. It's like, it's difficult being up here because I, I, you know, I deal with all these complexes and, and these anxieties. And I'm like, man, you're so quiet. Are they listening? Yes, sir. So talk with me. Tell me. It's all right. <laughs> right? And so he had plans for them. And so now the question is, why would he intentionally send them into a storm and him not be in that boat with them? Matthew 14, 22 says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that the disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. While he sent the people home, after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble away from land, for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting the heavy waves. And so, it's at this point, see, because at this point, you know, we start, we start, we could be like, man, God is so mean. Right? If we start thinking from like our mindsets, we're like, oh man, God's so mean. Why would he send them intentionally into a storm? Why would he send them knowing that that was going to happen? Why didn't he stop it and said and tell them, hey, don't get on the boat? Right? But see, I want to I invite you guys a little bit into, into what it's like to be a director or what it's like to disciple men or to, um, to develop leaders. You know, because the men that I have in the home, they're, they're leaders. And so... A part of this process, please is small. A part of this process, I'm gonna sit down here, you guys, if that's okay with you. So, a part of that process is, as these men come into the home, everything about them I have to learn. I have to learn their tendencies, their characteristics, their strengths, their weaknesses, their passions. All these things I have to be intentional about with them, and I have to learn about them. Right now, after a while that they've been in the home, intentionally I'll watch them. I'll watch them very carefully. And as I see little, little weak areas, I'll come in and I'll throw a little fire. Remember that gave, right? right? Hey, look what the Bible says, bro. Hey, right? right? To encourage them because I'm trying to ignite a passion in them and a flame to see God, right? right? And so, now this is where it gets tricky because at this point, they get to a certain point where they're now ready. They're ready. What I mean by ready is they're ready for growth, right? Yeah, and so sometimes they have a difficult time finding their way for growth. So... I have to intentionally, I have to intentionally and strategically put them into a position to where they're going to feel stress, they're going to feel discomfort, where the norm is no longer the norm, they're going to be provoked to make decisions outside of what they're used to, right? I have to intentionally put them in a place where they will feel the weight of responsibility over other people's lives, Amen. right? And uh, this, is the, this is the fun part, because while they're going through it, like, they're over here, and they're freaking out, they're just like, you can see it in their face, they're stressed out. They're like, brother, everyone's going to trip on me, he's going to rebuke me. If I don't do this right, God's going to be mad. And so, like, you see them just stressed out. Yes. And so, now the important part about that process, the important part of, about that process, and what's going to make it effective, is that I don't put my hands in it. I will not come to them and tell them, hey, buddy, it's going to be okay. Hey, look, it's going to be all right, bro. Don't worry, right? What I do, though, is, is I watch them. Because remember, my eyes never come off of them. I watch them. And I'll run to my room. And while they're going through it out in the living room, I'm in my room. Father, give them wisdom. Father, give them understanding. Give them clarity. Father, I pray that the relationship will come. Give them what God would in my life so that they can stand and that they can know you. Right? 
And so what happens is, it's really cool because this is the part that's rewarding. See, the guys go to bed by 10, but I allow the staff to stay until about 11 o'clock, right? And so the great thing is that I'll come out of my room 11.30 at night, and while everybody else is asleep, that person going through it is on his knees, and he's seeking out God. They're up an hour before everybody else, seeking God, seeking wisdom, seeking His faith. And so, I'm telling you, what makes that process effective of revelation isn't me coming to them and saving them, but it's me setting them up so that they can begin to call out to God and revelation can come to them. Amen? So, you guys got to understand that sometimes I think that our way is to destroy us. But it's to right. reveal Christ. Woo. It's to reveal identity. Amen. Right? Come on, that's it. Now the Lord says in Romans 8.34. It says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. The hand of God, who indeed, who indeed is interceding for us. It says that he's interceding for us. Now listen, I'm going to take you back to Matthew 22, or Matthew 14.22. It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples go back into the boat and cross to the other side. Verse 23. After sending them home, listen to what Jesus was doing. He went up into the hills by himself to pray. So listen, when you begin to go into these seasons, you have to know the Bible says that he is interceding for you. And though you might not see him there, you have to understand that he sees you. And as he sees you, he's being intentional about what he's doing you. He's developing you. He's growing you. He's maturing you. He's giving you wisdom. He's giving you understanding. So you have to know, listen, it's not that you're not good enough. It's not that you're weak. But it's that God has a plan and a purpose to empower you. To empower you because there is great things that he has to do through you and with you. Amen. Come on. Matthew 14, 24 says, Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land. For a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. But at about 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified and fear. They cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid. He said, take courage, for I'm here. Amen. You're going to face storms. Yeah. The yeah. winds are going to come. Yes. The waves are going to come. Listen, I'm telling you right now, they are going to come. Yeah. But what you have to know right now is that God is with you. Listen, there is something that God placed in my spirit, and I'm going to say it to you right now. I don't know where you're at, and I don't know what you're going through, but there was a scripture that was in my heart. And in the scripture, it says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not the spirit, for I am with God. I will strengthen you. I will raise you up from my victorious right hand. And you have to know that he's with you. He's with you. Listen, it says... Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on the land. Verse 48. The Bible says that he saw. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the winds. He sees you. He sees you. You might think nobody's watching. You might think you're alone. You might think you've been abandoned. You might think you've been rejected. You've been think, you might think you're neglected. But believe me, he sees you. He Come sees on. you where you're at. Come on. He knows exactly what's going on. Yeah. Now, just to give you guys an account, it says, uh, Mark 6, 51, 52 says, For they still had no understanding of the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. Every miracle and every healing that Jesus did was a manifestation of his power. But they weren't able to understand they weren't. And so whatever storm you're going through right now, I'm going to tell you something. It's not that you need a miracle. It's that you need revelation of who He is. If you are able to get revelation of who He is, you will stand. You will stand and you'll see the mountain move. You will stand and that path will become straight. You will stand and those oh, that sea will open for you. Yeah. When you look back, that enemy that pursued you, when you look back, Pharaoh won't be there no more. Yeah. You have to know that Pharaoh won't be there no more. But if you don't have revelation, Come on. let me tell you, you're going to get tossed. Yeah. And you're going to get pushed. And you're not going to be able to stand. And it's not because God didn't hear you. And it's not because God didn't see you. 
is that you didn't get revelation as to who he was. You understand that? And because of that, there was doubt. And you'll doubt. Right? So, you know, I was explaining to you guys about that whole process I do with the men with uh, developing leadership. Now, if and for whatever case they fail to get the lesson, right, you have to understand that failure isn't a bad thing. Right? Because of that failure, what will happen is now I have a platform. Yes. I have a platform where I will pull them into my office. I'll sit with them and I'll bring the word of God and I'll say, look, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll probe and I'll ask questions because they need to learn self-discovery. Right? I can't sit there and give them every answer. They have to learn for themselves. Okay. And so what will happen is I'll ask them, hey, bro, so what's going on? What happened? I don't know, man. This guy's tripping. He's, he's not listening to me. Okay, well, how did you go about dealing with it? I don't know. I told them this and I told them that. Why would you do that? What do you mean? Yeah, bro, I was like, you know, you can't talk to people like that. Right? You have to use wisdom. And I said, look what the Word of God says. Right? And in that moment, I'm bringing them the Word of God. And as they're reading it, they're starting to root understand right they start to get revelation they start to see their error and in that failure they're able to stand strong because I'm going to put them again in the same situation with different people Do you understand I, I continually keep on teaching and while they're with me or some as long as they're within my presence I will always sit there and teach them and let me tell you as long as you always stand in the presence of God he will always teach you come on he will amen. never stop amen. teaching you he will never stop developing you amen, amen? So, Matthew 14, 20, it says, Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. Listen, they got revelation of the storm. They said, you really are the Son of God. <coughs> he wasn't the one that provided. He wasn't the one that healed. They knew him now as the Son of God. And if you guys continue reading, you see that the next place he took them was a place where the people would now bring the sick to them. Come on. They, wherever, they would just bring them out. In order for God to take you to that next place of glory, listen, he has to develop a new understanding and identity. Come on, say that. Right? But in order for you to receive that, you have to go through the storm. And you have to learn to stand in faith. Yeah. Right? There's a, I'm going to do like a little side note. But, um, you know, when Jesus was with, with, with his disciples, um, he was getting ready because they were about to take him captive and they were going to take him to the cross. Right? And now he knew that the disciples were going to fail. He knew that Peter was going to deny him. He knew it. Now, in his wisdom, Jesus could have been like, hey, bro, look, make sure that when this happens, you run left, and then I'll run right, and we can avoid it, right? But the Bible says that Jesus didn't tell him that. If anything, he came to him and said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed to the Father that your faith will not fail you. Amen. Listen, he's not going to pull you out of the storm, and he's not going to help you avoid the storm. You're going to have to go through the storm, Amen. and his prayer is that your faith will not fail you. You have to stand in faith. And so, my brother Eric, right Dad. <laughs> and so, I want to listen. It's important to understand that we need the storms. As crazy as it sounds, as crazy as it sounds, we need the storms because the thing that God has planned for us is greater than what we can ask of Him. Right. We have to understand that it's the way we're going to get through it. Is by standing in faith. Faith of knowing that who he is, that he will not leave us, nor he will forsake He's not going to forsake us. He's Come not going to abandon us. Come on. Right? But to get to that point, we need that revelation as to who he is to be able to stand strong. Right. Amen? And so I want to I share with you guys a story. It's a, it's a funny story, but... Um, so, there was a farmer one time and he went out to the fields, right? And as he's working in the fields, um, he came across an egg. He came across this egg, and it was a big egg. He's like, man, I wonder what's in this egg. He's like, I know. He said, I'm gonna take it back home with me. And I'm gonna put it in with the, with the hens so that they can take care of it, right? And so, 
while they were there, you know, they hadn't had their eggs, and they put the egg with the with the other hands, and so as time went by, these chicks started to crack and come out, and so finally it came time for that big egg to crack, and the farmer was like, oh wow, it's an eagle, right? There was an eagle there. Now, as the chicks grew up, the eagle grew up with them, and so his whole life, he was surrounded by chickens, his mother was a chicken, his siblings were chickens, you know, and so he just, he lived his life at peace. He was a chicken, he was happy, he was taken care of, he was okay. But one day, one day there was an eagle, and he was soaring the skies, and he was patrolling the land, just looking to see what was going on. And he, he sees out of the corner of his eye that there's an eagle on the ground. And so he flies down to that eagle, and he says, hey, he's like, bro, what are you doing? He says, I don't know what you're talking about, man. He's like, I'm just here chilling with my family, you know? He's like, dude, he's like, you're an eagle. What are you doing down here? And he says, no, 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 hold on, bro. I'm a chicken. That's my mom. That's my brother. That's my sister. I'm a chicken. He's like, bro, look, you're an eagle. What are you doing down here? He said, bro, I'm a chicken. Look. And he starts, shh, shh, right, 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 right. He's like, see, he's like, I'm a chicken. And so the eagle at that point, he's like, man, this guy's not going to get it. So he grabs the eagle and he begins to fly high up into the air. He's flying, he's flying. He takes him to a high place. Now the eagle starts freaking out. He's like, bro, what are you doing? I'm a chicken. I don't know how to fly. He's like, if you draw me, I'm going to die. He's like, no, you're an eagle. He said, no, I don't know how to fly. And so he takes him up high and he lets him go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 